In this roundup of the week, anti-racism campaigners choose increasingly bizarre targets, battles are won against cancel culture, but mostly we're losing the war, and France's Citizens' Assembly on Climate Change comes up with its list of demands. My name's Malin Baker, this is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome back to the unrecognisably woke Mary Poppins remake that is 2020. I hope you're well and dodging the virus. And the virus is resurgent in some parts of the world, but we're not going to be talking about that this week because the game of consequences continues to rumble across our politics and across our world. Indeed, the consequences following the death of George Floyd have now moved from the serious anger that was shared by the mass of ordinary people who had witnessed a truly brutal and horrifying event, to the utterly bewildering, as activists of all sorts get more and more desperate and random in their choice of targets. So this week in Wisconsin, we saw the toppling of a statue of Colonel Hans Christian Hegg. Hegg was an abolitionist who died fighting slavery. He was a Norwegian immigrant and prison reformer who took up arms against slavery in 1861. In the Battle of Stones River, his horse was shot under him and he was described by one commander as the bravest of the brave. He was leading a pursuit of Confederate forces in 1863 when he was shot and killed. That was a man who fought and died in opposition to slavery. Not woke enough for a bunch of protesters who, I hazard a guess, have never been called upon to show a fraction of that courage in the name of the cause that they claim to care about. The statue was erected in 1924 to honour him. Local committees had spent years raising the funds to do it, to honour this man who, when his death was reported, was described thus. The state has sent no braver soldier and no truer patriot than Hans Christian Hegg. 2,000 local people gathered to see the statue unveiled in 1926. It's been maintained and cleaned since then as an important legacy from the Civil War. Here's a picture of two very heroic protesters carrying off part of the statue after it was torn down and tossed in the river. Do they look heroic to you? True patriots of their time, I would say. Or if not them, how about their colleagues? who saw 60-year-old Democratic State Senator Tim Carpenter, who was filming the demonstration on his mobile phone, and attacked him. Punching and kicking him in the head, the attacks left him with a suspected concussion, a fractured nose, amongst other injuries. But still, the protesters are all just out there because they want to make the world a better place. Presumably, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo would agree with that sentiment since he sent earlier this week in his view, tearing down and otherwise vandalising statues was just fine. A healthy expression against racism. I'm not sure what you would describe this week's various flashpoints as. Surely it wouldn't be healthy. In Alabama, the world of America's most popular motorsport, NASCAR, was rocked by the report that someone had known had hung a noose up in the garage assigned to Bubba Wallace, the only black driver in the sport. NASCAR expressed outrage. The media, celebrities and politicians all expressed outrage. All the other drivers gave solid expressions of solidarity. And the FBI dispatched no fewer than 15 officers to investigate this awful crime. Except it wasn't a noose. It was a rope tied in a small loop knot for a pulley that was used to open the garage door. And it had been there at least since last October. And many of the garages in the same row all have exactly the same door pull. So, I mean, a great relief there. Good to know that the driver wasn't being targeted in some awful scumbag kind of a way. It took a while before certain people would accept that this discovery meant that it wasn't really racism. They kind of mostly got there in the end. But a story about nothing generated many headlines, once again up to the temperature on the whole issue. There were some things that got fewer headlines. While protesters were destroying statues of anti-slavery heroes whilst calling for the police to be defunded, 
And whilst people were expressing outrage over garage door pulleys, in Chicago last weekend, more than 100 people were shot, 14 of whom died, including a 13-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy. There have been 125 shootings in New York. In Minneapolis, the scene of George Floyd's death, there were at least 30 people shot last weekend. In Detroit, there were 18 shootings, four of whom died. Nobody's much been talking about those deaths. They were mostly black people who died. It was mostly black criminals who killed them, not white cops, which is apparently why nobody much is talking about them. I happen to find that rather strange. If Black Lives Matter, you would think you would be asking yourself, what are the factors that are putting the most black lives at risk? And what would we therefore do? What would be the most sensible policies that we could all agree on that would begin to change that situation? And I say probably agree. In this election year, Republicans and Democrats are unwilling to pass any crime bill produced by the other side, as we've seen this week. But probably one thing you would need would be a highly respected police force that would attract people who want to serve their communities with honour. And good luck with that over the last few weeks. According to Professor of Criminology Eugene O'Donnell, the NYPD has just disbanded its anti-crime unit of plainclothes police officers whose job it was to remove illegal guns from the streets. According to The Times newspaper, he said that the morale of the police force was rock bottom. Nobody wants to be on the job. A huge number of people express the desire to leave. Recruiting has collapsed. Everything is risk avoidance. You only handle things you absolutely can't avoid handling. But of course, Black Lives Matter, the organisation, isn't much interested in these things because it's a political organisation. People don't even want to hear about criticism of it because to criticise the organisation runs the very real risk of being held to criticise the sentiment that its name implies, which of course nobody wants to do. And if you want to see why nobody wants to be mistaken for doing that, you only have to look at the UK. On Monday this week, two things happened at the Premier League soccer match between Manchester City and Burnley. First, before the match started, players and staff had taken the knee in support of Black Lives Matter. And this is a standard thing at the moment. Indeed, players in a number of clubs have been playing with the words Black Lives Matter on the back of their shirts rather than their names. And then second, a few moments later, a plane flew overhead trailing a banner with the message White Lives Matter Burnley. This was condemned in the most vigorous terms. The Burnley team captain, Ben Mee, said he was ashamed and embarrassed. The police were called to look into the matter, but quickly reported that no crime had actually been committed. The mayor of Burnley, Wajid Khan, said that the people who organised the banner were missing the point of the Black Lives Matter movement. He added this. And it's about time they need to be educated, just like we've been educating people around homophobia, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. We've got to look at all of the injustices of society and stand up to them and deal with them. You don't debate with people in modern Britain, apparently. You educate them. And of course, as in most instances where people say that other people need to be educated, what that usually turns out to mean is that they need to be fired. Jake Heppel, the Burnley fan who organised the flight, was promptly sacked from his job with paradigm precision, as well as given a lifetime ban from Burnley football matches. He said, I stand by this banner and what it says 100%. I'm not sorry at all and I'm not ashamed of what I've done. We were not trying to offend the movement or black people. I believe that it's also important to acknowledge that white lives matter too. That's all we were trying to say. His girlfriend, Megan Rambat, was also sacked from her job, which apparently was because she'd been posting racist messages on social media. Although I've not seen the content of those messages, which sort of matters because we can't wholly take people's word for it when they say that something was racist because that label gets attached to things very easily these days, depending on who you're talking to. And you can look at all this 
and get caught up with one side or the other and get very heated. But this case throws into sharp relief one of the transformations that's going on right now. It's worth spending a moment to acknowledge. Black Lives Matter, the dictionary definition of those words, and the standard linguistic meaning of them arranged in that order, it's a message I've not seen anybody disagree with. I haven't seen anybody use the words black lives don't matter. Arguably, as a campaign slogan, it's a little redundant if everyone agrees with it. However, Black Lives Matter, capital B, capital L, capital M, is the name of an organisation. It's an organisation whose leaders and whose materials have been fairly unapologetically on the radical end of the left spectrum. The campaign is founded on the premise that it is the state and the police that is the key impediment to the safety and success of black people. This is the group, after all, whose New York president, Hank Newsom, said this. If this country doesn't give us what we want, then we will burn down this system and replace it. I could be speaking figuratively. I could be speaking literally. It's a matter of interpretation. This was a comment President Trump called treason, which is not an indefensible response. That is the implicit message. And when many of these extremely well-meaning athletes and others take the knee and wear those words on their shirts, you have to assume in outline, in outline because few of them are that politically interested to look into the details, they accept the basic premise because they're horrified at recent events, as all decent people are, and they therefore accept the word of these representatives of the black community and assume they're giving them the valid representation of what this is all about. When they wear the Black Lives Matter slogan on their back, it's therefore not just the dictionary definition of words, but support for the movement as they understand it to be, which is the authentic voice of black victims of racism and violence. The problem comes because the organisation doesn't match that description. And yet the sentiments and the organisation become so thoroughly intertwined that to criticise one is to be seen as advocating against the other. In other words, if you suggest you're not a supporter of Black Lives Matter, capital B, capital L, capital M, then you're held to be saying black lives don't matter. Which hopefully is not what anyone intends to say. Then you have the phrase white lives matter too, or alternatively, all lives matter. There are people in the last couple of weeks who have been sacked for saying both of these things. Some of them, and maybe in the Burnley case, may well have been said with racist intent, but many of them certainly were not. Again, if you take the dictionary definition and the meaning of the sentences as straightforward expressions of ideas, all decent people would have to say that they are or should be just as true, just as universally held. Of course, all lives matter. And as a natural consequence, of course, white lives matter. But we are suddenly in a situation where a campaign group has defined those phrases, in spite of what the words actually say, to be a racist or at best misguided denial and abnegation of the spirit of the movement. Now, they can do that. They're not the first campaign group to try to define phrases to mean something distinctive to their own concept. But the interesting thing here is that broader society is accepting and absorbing that rewrite of linguistic intent. For using a phrase, the literal meaning of which nobody could disagree with, people have been sacked because it is assumed that they used it with racist purpose. Indeed, by this definitional trick, there is now no accepted response to Black Lives Matter that isn't taken as evidence of racism. And that's something that society is implicitly supporting and ultimately giving the force of law. So it's not just about the sentiment. We're also buying into the whole social outlook. So if you say these things that would have been held to be uncontroversial just a couple of years ago, not even 10 years ago, just a couple of years ago, you will now be judged to be self-evidently saying something reprehensible on a moral level. And you better be keeping up because we're all expecting you to know that it's reprehensible and will therefore judge it to have been an intentional statement of evil, should you say it. 
Well, of course, there's a problem with that. Radical campaign groups who want literally to bring down the system are probably not the people whose logic and mindset you want to be institutionalizing and legitimizing. And so, of course, you're going to get some kickback against it, as you should, because it's incredibly damaging. Because as soon as the institutions start playing favourites, it's going to be interpreted as unfair. And right now, with lockdown-induced poverty looming large, we live in a tinderbox. Take this tweet from police about a planned Black Lives Matter event in Sunderland. Remember, it's still against lockdown rules to gather together in groups more than six people. We'll be in attendance to facilitate a planned Black Lives Matter vigil at Keel Square in Sunderland tonight. A Section 14 order is in place forbidding any other public assembly, including counter-protests, to ensure the public safety. So the police facilitate the Black Lives Matter protests, but all other protests are banned, and specifically counter-protests. On what grounds do the police support one protest group breaking the law while warning others not to do the same? I mean... Never mind what the issues are and how you feel about them. How is that even conceivably a sustainable position? It's in the same league as Lincoln County in Oregon, which issued an order this week requiring white people to wear face masks, but black people who, as we know, have been more susceptible to COVID-19, well, they don't have to. Which is literally treating black and white people differently purely on the basis of their skin colour. Let's go back to Burnley for a moment. Burnley, the town. It is, according to statistics, the 11th most deprived area in England and Wales. The worst performing children in Burnley in education are white kids who are on free school meals. In other words, the most deprived. This is probably more a reflection of the attitudes of their parents to, towards education than it is any systemic thing. But yes, places like that then become hotbeds of resentment when they see what they believe to be unfairness in how people are treated. In 2001, the town saw race riots as unemployment and resentments in the town soared. What do we think is happening to unemployment in places like Burnley right now, COVID-19 and all? The White Lives Matter message becomes a more pointed counter message in that context, and not one that's likely to be much satisfied by being told off for not being woke enough. So as for potentially serious side. In the meantime, we live in a world where people are losing their jobs because of the smallest transgressions of the Cultural Revolution. Now, there has been some successful fight back. A couple of weeks ago, in the long list of people I talked about, and people who got fired for not saying very much, was the Isle of Man radio host, Stu Peters. He'd had a conversation on his call-in programme where he argued against the idea of white privilege. He told the caller that he had no more privilege in my life than you have, adding, I'm a white man, you're a black man. Now, you may agree with that or you may disagree with that. Talk radio hosts are there to have interesting and often lively discussions with people with differing opinions. At the joy of free speech. Maybe someone says something you think to be idiotic, and you get to tell them why what they said was idiotic. It's a fine system. But it got him fired. Now, Peters was a member of the Free Speech Union set up by Toby Young. And Young complained to the media regulator, the Communication Commission. And that complaint was successful, with a ruling delivered this week that Peters' comments had not broken the rules. The commission said it was likely the comments was intended to highlight that there were many types of discrimination and prejudice, but he considered them to be insensitive. And today, Manx Radio confirmed with a release on its own website that Stu Peters was back, but it won't carry live calls with him. The first sentence of a release is Manx Radio in no way condones racism in any form, which seems to suggest that regardless of the legal niceties, it still does kind of think its presenter was a little bit racist. And now there won't be live calls from listeners. Instead, they'll take comments by text and by Twitter, where presumably they can filter out anything that might descend into a problematic discussion. In a statement, Peter says that this was at his own request. The Free Speech Union has been doing sterling work on all of this because it also announced another victory today. Physics lecturer Mike McCulloch of the University of Plymouth had been under investigation for liking tweets, including one that said all lives matter. However, following approaches by the Free Speech Union, that investigation has been dropped. So does this mean that society is coming back to its senses? 
Yeah, probably not. The chair of the board of British Columbia University has resigned after liking tweets criticising Antifa and Black Lives Matter protesters. The board of governors of Mr. Corenberg would like to recognise that this has been deeply hurtful to members of our community and that UBC has zero tolerance for racism. Liking tweets? Still bad for your career, apparently. Emmanuel Cafferty, a Hispanic truck driver, has been fired after a fellow driver put a picture of his arm hanging out of his truck window on Twitter. This would not normally be held to be a sackable offence, you would think. But the tweeter suggested it was a white power symbol and a BLM protest was taking place nearby. Cafferty said he didn't even know what the symbol was and he was just cracking his knuckles. The Reverend Daniel Patrick Maloney has been forced to resign as chaplain of MIT after sending an email to students in which he questioned whether racism was a motive in the killing of George Floyd and pointed out that he did actually have a criminal record, which is true. And the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago has cut ties with Harold Ulig, the economist at the University of Chicago, saying his opposition to defunding the police was incompatible with its values of diversity and equity and inclusion. So if you don't think it's a good idea to defund the police, that's not a policy disagreement. That's because you have the wrong values. But at least one person has had their institution stand by them. Dr. Priyamvada Gopal, a Cambridge academic who tweeted, White lives don't matter and abolish whiteness in response to the Burnley incident, has not been fired by Cambridge University in spite of the ensuing controversy. Indeed, the university said it defended the right of its academics to express their own lawful opinions, which others might find controversial, which is absolutely what we want to hear from universities. Some people were unkind enough to point out this wasn't exactly the university's position when it cancelled Professor Jordan Peterson's planned three-month tenure a little while ago. But that seems just ungrateful. I mean, come on. You want consistency. What are you, animals? And speaking of ungrateful, the university's general support for free speech wasn't enough for Dr Gopal, who demanded that the university do more to advance the national conversation on race. She said, I would like to see the university take the lead. Instead of a statement on freedom of speech, actually, there is something to be said about a critical look at whiteness. Does any of this end well? Maybe. Maybe if we just fire all of the bad people, we'll end up with a worldwide utopia. You know, like the Seattle Autonomous Zone that we've been hearing about. Chaz or Chop or Chump or something. Not everybody is happy living in paradise, however. Does the ingratitude never end? Residents and businesses based in the zone have filed a class action lawsuit against the city for extensive harm suffered since they were basically abandoned by law enforcement and the authorities to the protesters' anarchic rule. There have been four shootings in the area since Saturday, with one person dead. The litigants say that their properties have been blocked, barricaded, occupied and vandalised. They have had to deal with constant harassment, loss of income and an inability safely to move about. Which, you have to say, sounds like a fair complaint. Apparently, quite a few of the protesters have now started to drift away, so it's not quite clear exactly how and when that episode comes to an end. But it might be quite soon, depending on how large a die-hard contingent is left over. But I'm guessing it's not going to be remembered as the utopian moment that showed America how much better life would be if you could just abolish the police. Now, it'll be tempting to say that all the nonsense is just another example of what I pointed out here before. The inability of leaderless campaign movements to develop or follow even a basic strategy that's competent to achieve their goals. And that would be fine, but there's more. Because no campaign group can achieve all of the things that we've seen in the last few weeks on their own. There is a much deeper culture war. And many pillars of the establishment are utterly confused about what's going on and how it plays out. And they are inadvertently making it a lot worse. If what we all knew yesterday is apparently deeply racist today, what do you do with that sort of shift if you're a football club or a major retailer or a government department 
or even the police. When there are things that need to be kicked back against, how many are going to do that when even raising questions can get you fired at best and granted permanent pariah status at worst? It's a good question, without an obvious answer. All right, while all this is going on, racism isn't the only issue, of course, that we're having to deal with. In France, we now have an answer to the question, what happens if you set up a panel of 150 randomly selected citizens to deliberate and tell you what policy you should follow to tackle climate change? This week, the Citizens' Assembly, set up by President Macron last year, voted on its final proposals. You'll recall that the extreme climate campaigners Extinction Rebellion called for a Citizens' Assembly. In their case, they want the British Parliament to completely hand its decision-making power. In other words, to completely remove environmental decision-making from democratic accountability. Some would say, a brave idea. Macron didn't go that far, but he did promise that measures would either be acted on or put to the people in a referendum. This was Macron's attempt to dig himself out of a hole he'd been thrown into by the Yellow Vest protesters, who initially began their often violent demonstrations sparked by Macron's plan for an increase in fuel taxes. And you can see the plan. Embrace all the easy wins that come out of the group, gain credit for taking action, but the controversial items send those to the people for them to vote down, leaving the president blameless when they do so. If your starting assumption is that your government is completely incapable of showing leadership, then it's not the worst plan. Is that starting assumption true? Well, maybe. Every French government has tended to cave relatively quickly once the demonstrations pick up pace. There must be reasons for that. I mean, French history is full of pivotal moments brought about by the action of the mob. Such things become reality if everyone agrees that they're reality. Now, amongst the proposals were some fairly challenging ideas. Only one was considered to be too challenging to be passed. Every proposal put before the Assembly was voted through except for the proposal to reduce the maximum working week from 35 hours to 28. Some of the others nevertheless raised a few eyebrows. One was the passing of a law against what they termed ecocide which was a measure that was considered by the French Senate last year and rejected. Ecocide was defined as seriously and lastingly damage the environment and the conditions of existence of a population in execution of a concerted action tending to the destruction or the total or partial degradation of an ecosystem in peacetime as in times of war. The group is suggesting that issue is put to a referendum since Parliament didn't pass it previously. Another measure was for the reduction of the speed limit on motorways from 130 km per hour to 110. That received a derisive response from the Yellow Vest campaigners, and a petition against it has already received half a million signatures. Then there's a whole bunch of bans. Ban the sale of vehicles with higher emissions by 2025. Ban the advertising of polluting products. Ban heated terraces or the lighting of shops at night. Ban domestic flights if destinations can be reached by a train in less than four hours. Ban fishing in deep waters and develop environmentally friendly aquaculture farms to ultimately replace all fishing at sea. The French fishermen gearing up to fight any government concessions to Britain arising from Brexit. Well, they may have a thing or two to say about that. Oh, and add preservation of the environment and the fight against climate change to the country's constitution. There was originally something in there also about possibly banning 5G networks, since they use more electricity than 4G. That's been watered down to a requirement for it to be investigated but before committing to granting licenses to companies to run 5G networks. The group was tasked by the French government with coming up with the measures to get the country to net zero by 2040. And of course it hasn't done that at all. As you would expect for this sort of exercise, it's come up with a list of bright ideas, not a comprehensive plan. And if it's an indicator of how this would play out in the UK, if it were done here on the same basis, you'd have to say that the radicalism of these proposals, discomforting though they may be to the French president in this case, 
they wouldn't satisfy the likes of Extinction Rebellion. And having seen the preliminary report of the UK operation, which is a purely consultative version, which also came out this week, I would say that applies there as well. And the exciting news from that quarter is that Extinction Rebellion activists are setting up a new UK political party with the help of XR founder Roger Hallam. I know! Excitement doesn't begin to describe it. Called Beyond Politics, the Beyond Politics Party, the new party stands for blowing up the system and turning it over to, yes, you guessed it, a citizens' assembly. The new website for the party has a distinctive message, which carries the hallmarks of authorship by Roger Hallam himself. I can't really read it to you. It swears a lot. And unusually for the website of a political party, makes references to sexual acts. It could well be that it will redefine the tone of voice for all party political websites in the future, but I'm guessing probably not. Now, like me, you might be thinking that racism is actually an important issue in the real world, calling for a mature approach. And you might also be thinking that environmental issues are actually quite important, calling for an evidence-led and mature approach. Do we have the change movements we need in these areas right now? I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest we can do better than this. Do you agree? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks again to the great people who have signed up to support this channel on Patreon and those who signed up particularly after last week's episode. Last week's video was once again demonetized, although it was also once again restored on appeal, which seems to be the pattern now, so long as we're talking about either the pandemic or Black Lives Matter. Although if it gets too edgy, it doesn't get restored. Having patrons means that I can focus on the issues that matter, regardless of whether those videos can be monetized or not. So, if you want to support the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that this channel aims to provide, please consider adding your support to that of the wonderful people that have done so already. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Mm -hmm.